Welcome back to Faith, Family, and Politics. This is your guest host, Sarah Metcalf Allen, wife of the perfect producer, Sterling, over there, who is actually producing tonight. We got a special episode. It is Ladies' Night. Woo! 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 <laughs> we are so excited to be here. I hope you all enjoy it. Let us know in comments and like it and love it. And <laughs> make sure you share because, you know, sharing is caring. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, make sure you also find us on all of the socials and anywhere you have your podcast, YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, all the fun stuff. Follow us. And again, just do all things. Let us know how awesome us ladies are and we'll do this again. <laughs> Anyways, introducing our guest here, we have the wonderful Crystal Rosati. I was like, let her say my voice went off. <laughs> <laughs> welcome. So Thank glad to have you. you here. Thanks. Good to be here. And then welcome back, my mother, Yvonne <laughs> Metcalf, the softer side of FFP, from what I hear. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and a very special guest, first time appearing, my best friend, Michelle Foreman, who will be bringing our message today. Hello. Yay. There's her face, her wonderful, beautiful face. All right. Are we ready? Let's get this party started. Let's go. Da, 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 What's da, da, our da. message title today? Protect. All righty. I'm going to lead us in a quick prayer, and then I'll let Michelle take the floor. Thank you, Lord, so much for uh, this time to be together, and uh, I just pray that we will listen to your word and interact with each other and build each other up in how to protect, and thank you for all of your protection that you give to us, and it's in your wonderful and holy name, name of Jesus, I pray, amen. 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 Okay, so my first scripture is 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4. It is praise be to the to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Okay, so what made you think of that verse, that passage? Um, it just, it really talk to me about like I'm trying to think of the right words here uh, just like when like for depression you need like comfort and I find this verse very comforting and I use it for my own self actually oh for sure and then at the end it talks about using the comfort that you've received to help others which goes along with our our message title protect yep you know thinking about like young people especially yes indeed uh use our experience right mm -hmm. okay go ahead keep going <laughs> <clears throat> my second scripture is philippians 4 6 through 7 be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which su surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those are very solid points. Like each one of those, I think we could talk about in great depth. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about it. Okay. So what's the first one? Read read that first like verse of that again. Of oh, the Philippians yeah. four. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a uh, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Yeah. So I like the fact that in the second part of the verse, it talks about let your request be made known, but with thanksgiving, because mm -hmm. when you have a thankful heart, it it just shifts your focus. It changes your perspective so that those anxieties and those worries and things aren't at the forefront of your mind. Yep. And they aren't as big either. You know, when you, when you focus on something, the bigger it appears. And so if you can put it toward the back of your mind instead of the front, then it <coughs> won't seem so big. Yeah. 
I think that goes along with the um, Lord's Prayer, too. Because if you look at the structure of the Lord's Prayer, he, he also gives thanks in that. And then also asks for different requests. So it's aligned with that. Oh, yeah. Definitely. He's our perfect example, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Sure and uh, what was the, the next verse in that Philippians passage? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Ooh, yeah, I've experienced that. Yep. And uh, and again, um, thinking about our word, protect. We want to protect our young people and ourselves, our minds, against depression, against anxiety. And the way to do that, you know, read the scripture. It tells us there. God gives us what we need there. Got anything else for us? Um, not really. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> so thinking in um, about like mental health and stuff, I know my church, what kind of got me and Michelle talking about this was my church is doing a conference um that um, we're going to talk about youth mental health and what we can do to help them. And so when I asked her to be on the show, and she's like, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, since you mentioned that, mental health is something um, that I think about. And I was like, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, okay, so the word that that popped in my head was protect. Mm -hmm. Um, And how can we do that? And that's why I like that first scripture from Corinthians, you know, using our experience to help younger people um, is such a huge thing. You know, I've, I've had several when I was younger and even now, so I'm not super old, but when I was a kid, I had adults that I could look to who listened to me and helped me and encouraged me. Like, you know, we're told, we are told to raise our children. I did a whole message about sending our children forth, shooting them like arrows, um, but, I mean, the Bible warns when you don't. You know, it's better that, um, you know, they want a millstone around your neck and thrown off a cliff, like, if you hurt little ones. Like, mm-hmm. like it's pretty drastic, but that is what God thinks about that. Like, mm-hmm. he cares about little ones. You know, Jesus said, let the little ones come. They are important. Mm-hmm. They're not just bothersome and, and annoying. Like <laughs> Kids today don't understand that they were created by God for a purpose, and I think they need to be taught that in church and really they need to be taught that in school too to be honest the schools complain about the mental health of the kids and then they they don't tell them these things and it's important to know that there's a god that loves them and cares about them and their friends and you know it's it's just one of those things that we are missing now totally agree with that and i think like i was reading there's a there's a thread on reddit and i posted about it on our church's page um, of teachers that are being attacked by kids. Um, first person accounts, people posting as teachers about these kids beating them up and hitting. One teacher was hit with a 20 pound weight on the head, and the schools are doing nothing. And my thought is okay, first of all, we've taken God out of school, so there's nothing to fear. Second of all, we've taught kids they're animals. Why would they not act like them? Yeah, they, they need to know the value of our life. Yeah, right. and they don't. They don't know that. I just broke up a fight on a elementary school playground behind my house a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Um, they It's just crazy to me. And then you add in the confusion <laughs> mm-hmm. that's being brought in to the culture and in schools in particular, um, starting with preschool kids about gender issues. Like, they're so confused and Puberty is a natural thing you go through. You have to make it through it. Toughen up, buttercup. I mean, we need to be forcing kids to do that in a kind way because we've all had to go through it. Mm-hmm. And It's you part can't, of life. It's it a is, season of life. It really is. And it, and it breaks my heart that people, they have such a virtuous attempt at trying to protect kids too much. Right, yeah, helicopter parents. Yes, <laughs> that, um, or just in general, um, that they're not allowing kids to go through trials and tribulations to develop those coping skills. Mm-hmm. 
And as long as, to me, kids aren't neglected or abused, then they should feel pain because everybody changes through pain. We grow and mature through pain. Now, we don't like it, and we don't like our friends and family to go through it, and that's a sad thing, and we want to feel empathy for them, and we want to support them as they're going through it. But it's a very fine line between helping people and hindering their growth. And we have to be cognizant of that. And, you have to thoughtful. you have to let them get the consequences for their decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to a certain point. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. We yeah. get it as adults. Yeah, and if us as adults seem so confused about it and have trouble, no wonder they're having trouble and they're right. struggling with their mental health. I mean, right. suicide rates in like teenagers is at an all time high. Like it's astonishing. Like, mm-hmm. and, and I uh, mean, it, it partly started with COVID too, when they tried to have everybody separate and pe- we need community. We need yes. that interaction with each other. Social and, oh, and the other thing on that is the social media. That's a problem mm-hmm. too, because, um, my idea was I talked to someone the other day, we were talking about the problems that kids have being bullied on so- social media. Mm-hmm. And I said, they probably ought to put their phone in the basket at dinner time. They probably put, ought to put their phone in the basket before they go to bed. Mm-hmm. They probably ought to put their phone in the basket when they walk into school, and then they can get it when they leave school. They're, and that way, at least, they're not always... And, and they can interact with the people who are really in their life. You know, it's such a blurred line. Like, you all are really in my life right now, and I can see you and all, all you know, everything. And we communicate so much, not just verbally. Right. And so... On social media, you only get the typewritten text. That's all you get. Yeah. And you might get a video, but it's not the same as being in a person's life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It can as be much so as lonely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It could be a lonely lifestyle when you're too much into the media and the virtual stuff. Mm-hmm. It becomes isolating and very lonely. Mm-hmm. Even if you're talking to people on Xbox, they're not there with you. Mm hmm. Um, and I think it it's feeds not itself. The same. Do you mm-hmm. not think that? Do you think it feeds itself? Because I feel like I've worked at home for a lot of years. I'm struggling with it. I don't want to go back to an office. <laughs> I like my comfy, cozy house. Um, I don't. I can't do crowds anymore. Like I can't be in crowds anymore because I've I've been at home with peace and quiet, my dogs and me, and that's it for so long that now I've. I have to readjust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it can easily get a hold of us. It's hard not to. And, I mean, the older generation like us, we remember when we didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So it's not as as serious to us like as it is to, like, younger people who that's all they ever knew was you're on social media. And, um, yeah, we're in the generation that grew up with it, basically. It was really coming out. Right. It had just started as you were younger. And yeah, it really, it did. It affects people that way. As much as possible. I know that um, we talked about how much bullying and stuff happens on social media, but because the people are there, because the young people are there, we need to use it as a tool for good then. Mm -hmm. You know, share these Bible references that talks about, you can have peace that passes all understanding, you know. You don't have to go through life alone. You are loved. You are protected. Like we need to be that voice for them. It's true. It can be a good. It can be a tool for good as well. Mm-hmm. What are we looking at? Okay. Well, I kind of. I think we're going to spend a lot of time here, so I'm going to move us into the family portion. Um. What I wanted to ask was, did you deal with any mental health struggles as a child and uh, either what brought that on or how oh, did you deal oh, with oh, it? Oh. Okay, yes, go <laughs> to the excited Woo. young lady over here. Crystal, ready I'm to talk. To liven it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be party. <laughs> Where's our little... <laughs> Noise makers. See, she came back. <laughs> That's right. The, the life of the party, our other lady, Journey, has joined us. <laughs> Um, yes. So I, I just turned 55. I'm not afraid to say it. (laughs) 
Um, I feel like I'm a young 55, I think. But anyways, I just turned 55 and I keep thinking about, because I see the young people and the struggles they have. And I have the, my personal story that, you know, you guys know about. Um, and I look at my life when I was growing up. I was a tomboy. Like, I know I do makeup and hair and I like my shoes and my purses now, but I, and I always did that. But I was also in the dirt, right? I had a racing model snowmobile. I was on the motorcycle with my dad. I grew up with a horse. So I was in the barn with him a lot and, you know, things like that. If I grew up today, I would be told I was a trans. That, to me, it's a struggle for me now. It wasn't then so much. When I hit puberty, I hated it. Hated every minute of it. I cried. Um, but it's more, it affects me more now because I know that if I grew up in today's world, I know what they would do to me. And then I follow, you know, the D-trans stories. Um, and they're horribly affecting these kids in Permanently. a terrible way permanently mm -hmm. and in in destructive ways that cannot be fixed and these kids are now having more mental health struggles than they did before they were given blockers or hormone treatment or socially transitioned thank goodness that can be reversed um, or surgeries and so th it's heartbreaking I see what the culture and the world is doing to our kids and it makes me so angry inside like it's a righteous anger though I'm not going to sin be angry and sin not. <laughs> so I'm not going to do anything with that, but just try to talk about it and get the message out. Because at my age, looking backwards, it's it's just heartbreaking for me to see. Yeah. Um, that was my mental health issue. I mean, I didn't, I thought about suicide. I think every kid does at some point. I would never do it. But I did have the thoughts when I was young. I think that's just part of that age. So yeah, I did not have suicidal thoughts at that age. Mm. I thankfully grew up um, in, in a lot of ways. I'm very thankful to my parents. Um, they weren't perfect. <laughs> Who is? But um, I was a very happy-go-lucky and carefree kind of kid. My first experience with depression came when uh, my sister, who I was super close to um, after our brother died, she got married, like eloped, and didn't tell me. So... Right after high school. And so I was I was depressed. I was very sad. I stayed at home. And I remember going back to school and one of my friends looking at me and he said, Sarah, why don't you smile anymore? <laughs> and that like snapped me out of it. And that's all it took at that age. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, you know, I had a good environment, a good, you know, church family and things like that and a good relationship with God already. You know, that's one of those things. I'm so thankful that I grew up and I had a relationship with God at a young age. Because without too. that, no way. Like, I, no way. <laughs> I got to pull a Jen Saki and circle back on that. <laughs> Let's circle back. <laughs> and here's why. I also had a good upbringing. And, and when I say I struggled with it, it's because my father, who was my only ally I felt like in the world, died when I was 16. The week after, my mom sold the house. I came home from school and people were walking through my house buying all our stuff and I didn't know why. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And then when I asked, I was told, oh, mom sold the house. We have 15, 14 days to move. And she bought a trailer and she's moving to a park in Florida. And you have to live with your sister and brother-in-law and two kids for until you finish high school. And then you have to move to Florida. So that was a devastating. <laughs> yeah, that'll so that's do a it. lot of change in a few that'll in a short it. time. Yeah, especially and in that age of puberty. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. And so that's how I got into that, because my mom and I weren't getting along at that point. Looking back now, I know this is a lady show, right? <laughs> Looking back, I know she was in menopause during that time. So that explains a lot. Now it didn't then. Had no idea. We just butted heads a lot, and I was the apple of my dad's eye. Mm -hmm. So losing my one ally <laughs> that I had in the world was terribly, like, devastating. Yeah. And it led to a lot of bad decisions that I made in my life after that. 
um, trying to fill that void, I think. Mm -hmm. And also, I was never allowed, as being brought up in a good Christian home, I was never allowed to voice um, my opinion about things or be angry or show any kind of anger. Mm -hmm. So I internalized it all. Yeah. <clears throat> it took me until my 30s to recognize that a lot of the acting out I was doing was because of that, because I was so angry inside about all the things that happened and all the change. Yeah. And I had no one yeah. talking to me about it. I was just being told what was going to happen, and I had to go along with it. Yeah, you needed an outlet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I made really, really, really devastating bad choices. And then I had to live with the consequences of those bad choices. So it took me a long time to get back to where I needed to be. Yeah. Um, and, and here's the thing. That's my story. But I know so many stories coming out of kids being um, um, sexually taken advantage of as kids. Um, and they, they have a hard time working through that. We have the social media stuff. There were stories on the, the teacher thread where they were talking about, like, one in particular had kids that were being bullied at school. She decided to hold lunch in her classroom because that's the time they were being bullied. There was about five kids. And then the administration told her she couldn't do it anymore, so she had to let the kids go back to the gym so that the bullying could continue and no consequences were given to the kids bullying them. So think about those kids. Like every day I have to go face these bullies every single day and nothing's happening. Nobody's protecting me. Yeah. Right? Back to the theme. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's just so many things going on in the world now that my heart goes out to the kids yeah. so much. The younger because, generations. Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to say kids. People. Yeah. <laughs> It really does affect all of us, no yeah. matter our age. And uh, that is one of the good things about our, our world now is that there is more focus put on to mental health. And I think that's a good thing. But there's also extortion. Oh, yeah. Oh, of yeah. The mental For health. Sure. People calling it mental health and, and rushing kids into things that should not be dealt with at that age. Um, they're extorting it and, and twisting it. So there's some a, good and some bad. Right? <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a fine line between helping and hurting. Yeah. Did you experience anything mental health wise that you can recognize? You were a military brat, so oh, you moved around a whole bunch. And we did. <laughs> um, I didn't build relationships with people outside of my family because of that. Mm. I didn't have friends from when I was a child. You know, my husband lived in Indianapolis his, his entire life. So he had friends for 20 years or 30 years. I never had that when I was growing up. Um, my mom was an alcoholic. Um, I God healed our relationship later in life. But when I was young, and my dad was divorced when I was two. And so I was raised by my stepmom, who was the alcoholic, and my dad. And my dad, there again, was the I was the apple of his eye. And so he was my protector and yeah. my go-to person uh, when I was growing up. And um, I don't know. I just remember a lot of loneliness. And um, so I did have sadness. And you might call it depression at times. And just frustration with uh, and anger with everything that was going on with my parents. And, you know, just... Uh, there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot there, but uh, it really did. It really did um, affect me some. But I never, you know, I thought about, like you say, you know, oh, I wonder what it would be like to just be gone or something. Mm -hmm. But, and I actually had a friend who told me that just out of the blue. I mean, this girl, I went to see her, and she said, "I tried to kill myself yesterday," and I said, "You what?" <laughs> and I was like. You can't do that. I love you, and you have to stay here. And, you know, I just talked to her and talked to her. And she felt better after I talked to her, but it just shocked me. I was like, no, you can't do that. Because mm. I never, I mean, I never would have expected it from her. She was very quiet. And so she didn't, she probably just didn't talk about how she was feeling. Uh, people become very good at hiding it, whether mm -hmm. that is just being quiet and not talking at all or being extremely over the top and right. to hide it in that way. Like they, they find ways you got to really be watchful. Mm -hmm. um, and 
my experience now with mental health as I've gotten older and, and I have had those suicidal thoughts. I have had those, you know, I just want to leave everything and start over or something like that. Like I can see the way that I hit it. And so I think it's easier for me to see yeah. and recognize it in other people now. Right. <laughs> Whereas I, I had no clue when I was younger. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And that goes back to being able to help others then because of what you've been through. So. Right. The verse that Shell talked about. Right. Yep. Did you want to talk about your experience with mental health? I know there's there's a lot there. Oh, yeah. Share as little or <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> oh. My struggle with mental health started when I was really young. Um, I was six the first time I tried to commit suicide. Wow. But my mom walked into That's the so kitchen. That's so little. Yep. Well, I had, had been raped by my babysitter's son when I was four. So, and I didn't, I wasn't allowed to talk about it. I didn't even know where to begin to talk about it because I was so little. But I knew something was wrong. And I was just like, death is the only way out. So I tried to kill myself. I'm so glad you're that you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Me and too. Mm-hmm. And I just met you tonight. <laughs> yeah that was that was just the first of many uh did you understand at that age um did you remember everything and did you understand it wasn't something that was normal mm-hmm. you did yep i just didn't care yeah like i was hurting and I was tired of hurting. Mm-hmm. So so now she's in school uh, to learn how to be like a, a social worker because yes. she wants to help kids Beautiful. who are going through that. You yes. flipped that script. Trying to. Yep. She is Good trying to you. live out that verse mm-hmm. <laughs> using my struggles and my the comfort that I have received. Mm-hmm. I want to give to those kids says they need ever, it. <laughs> did you ever get support at some point? Uh, when I was much older, when I was 14, through puberty, I was I tried to kill myself a couple of, a few times. You mm-hmm. can't say a couple because it was a few times. Mm-hmm. So stuff we talked about is ringing a bell for you. Oh, yeah. That's mostly why I've been a little quiet over here. (laughs) Um, And it's just, I am grateful that I am alive. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Because even just, Last year, I sh- struggled. I can't even count how many times I tried to kill myself last year. But in April, it'll be a one-year mark since I've been to the hospital for it. So I'm proud of that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Lots of progress. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <Woo-hoo>. That's right. <laughs> Do you feel like you're... Um, healing from it slowly but yeah yeah because there's there's still a lot of abuse that i need to deal with and that i still have nightmares about Mm -hmm. but that's something else that we had to think about um that i've had to learn and grow in my understanding of mental health that these things don't happen overnight usually like it's usually an ongoing thing and so it's not going to be fixed overnight. It's going to take time. And we need people to step up and be there for that time, to give that protection, to give that support, to give that encouragement. I, and, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You're fine. <laughs> I, I do want to caution, though, because <clears throat> I think also, and this is the old lady wisdom coming. I'm the oldest one here, even in the <laughs> crowd. 
Um, Your old lady hat. <laughs> I'm grandma on the set. Uh, oh, no, wait, my mom's oh, right no, wait there. Wait I'm older than your mom. No, you're not. I'm not? Uh-uh. I thought I was older than you. No, I was born in 66. Oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, now the party she literally can start. is a grandma. I'm not, the the old one. I'm not the oldest one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do want to say a couple things here because I've also seen this happen. So, grandma backed me up. <laughs> All righty. Um, <laughs> we'll have a grandma party. Um, I, I feel like. It's a. It's also a fine line with that because you said till things get fixed and define fixed because it never is going to go away fully. It's always going to be there. The best you can do is develop coping mechanisms and call it done. Uh huh. And because the, you'll have scars. Exactly. Well, and the other thing is, be careful with. I'm going to say counseling and things like that because you can also do so much of that that you become completely isolated and focused on yourself and your healing that you forget about other people. You forget about what's going on around you. You forget about living life. Um, and, and, that, and that's why God that says to put others first yes. is one of the things that and does And you know help. what I found in those times that I've been really down and depressed about something, the best therapy I found is to go to a shopping center and there's inevitably some old lady, old gray hair that needs help putting stuff in her car or needs help getting something off the shelf. Um, and, and the best therapy to me to deal with that is when I get in those moments, I need to get away from me and go find somebody else to help. Um, and then at the end of the day, you, you have a sense of accomplishment, a sense of purpose. Um, you didn't sit and soak and sour in your misery and you focused on somebody else and they benefited. Another and it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. You, you can completely change your own perspective by doing that but it, it's just never going to be 100% healed and I think there's a lot of people that will continue trying to chase that I need 100% healing and it's just, it's never going to happen and so then you've set yourself up with false expectations and then you're depressed because that never happens yeah that's so. true that's true you're right and you have to keep the right uh like also giving thanks when we talked about that earlier with yeah. Thanksgiving yeah, is really a guard because when you, when you focus on the things that are good, then like I said before, the other problems seem smaller. Yeah. And really when you stop and think about all the things, I mean, God gives us so much every day. And if you, I've started to do something in the past two years, I write down things at the end of the day and put it in a jar for Thanksgiving Day so I can look at it the next year and and maybe share some things but uh and just look back over the past year and see how many little blessings God gave me and then in the morning before I leave I try to think of at least one thing that I can be thankful for before I start and that just changes my whole mindset or if I find myself going into that place where it's like everything's bad everything's wrong I'm so mad I can't take it then I start counting my blessings. Yeah. Or put I'm like, praise music on. Or put praise music that on. I'm works. like, okay, wait a second. <laughs> Hold time out. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that bad, okay? Right. <laughs> so, right. yeah, you really have to take, take control of your thoughts sometimes mm -hmm. and, um, you know, as much as you can. I think so, too. Not to dismiss anything. Like No, not I mean, there's not, it, there's, there's times that you just are overwhelmed, but yeah. there's times when you can change direction I, on purpose. I used to say, be careful what you think because you'll believe it eventually. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? True yeah. that. So we have to, we have to take, we have to take ownership of that and control of it. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he, mm -hmm. it says in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. I've seen... Um, I have an example of somebody I know that claims depression and anxiety to the point where um, they won't leave the house because they're so afraid they're going to get shot as soon as they walk out the door. And I thought to myself, if I sat in my apartment all day and told myself, if I walk out that door, I'm going to get shot. Eventually, I'm going to believe it. 
Mm-hmm. Right? So we teach ourselves how to think um, a lot of times. And so we have, we do have some control over that. Satan gives us these thoughts and he tries to put them in our head. We make the choice whether we're going to sit and entertain those thoughts or not. And whatever thoughts we entertain, I believe we turn into actions. Mm-hmm. Back to the verse so, you said. So there's some things that happen that are traumatic to us that we have no control right. over. Right. But then when the follow-up on that is when how we're dealing with it. Right. And so that's when we can come back th- through with and say. Exactly. You know, things are different now. That's been, you know, mm-hmm. years and God has taken care of me so far. And yeah. So what know. has been the best thing to help Michelle, what has been the best thing to help uh, for you uh, when thinking about your mental health? Oh, the best thing for me? Yeah, if you had to choose just one thing out of, out of the things that you have worked on or tried, what's been the best thing to help? My best friends. Oh, my goodness, having a support group. That helps so much. Somebody you can talk to freely. Yep. (laughs) You, your sister Carol, and the person who I call mommy, Kivya. Yep. Those are my three best friends. And they'll tell you the truth, too. Whether I want to hear it or not. (laughs) Exactly. I'm pretty good at that sometimes. (laughs) But kindly. Oh, the Kindly or not so kindly. (laughs) She she mostly does kindly. Sometimes she'll just be like, listen. (laughs) Listen, Linda. (laughs) What about you, Mom? What's the thing that, the one thing, if you had to choose, what helps you the most? When That's you probably like what that? I was just talking about with trying to refocus my thoughts. When I start feeling like I'm going in that direction, I have to stop and say, wait a minute. It is not that bad. Yeah. Not today, Satan. Right. <laughs> How about you? Same. Same. Just refocusing. Um, huh? Refocusing. First, you have to acknowledge. Right. <laughs> oh, yes. This is happening There's to me. That. I got to get my mind right and distract yourself to something else but also like I said earlier when I've been in down spots I'm going to seek somebody out that needs help that I can help because that brings me fulfillment Mm -hmm. and and then I'm not sitting there feeling like I'm a piece of crap and worthless because I've just proven I'm not and it it's just little things it doesn't have to be a big thing it could be um, I'm going to go next door and talk to my neighbor for a minute and check in with them and see how they're doing. Mm-hmm. That's a that's an effortless thing. It does not does cost not anything cost but anybody. time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or call somebody up that you know has been struggling with something and just check in with them. It means a million things. So so I can either choose to sit and and wait for somebody else to do that for me, right? Right. Or I can flip the script and I can take control and I can do it for somebody else. Yeah. Um, And oftentimes I don't, I don't care who I talk to. They've got a story worse than mine (laughs) at the moment. And and so it's ironic. It it gets my mind totally off of me. Yeah. Everybody's got stories and issues for sure. Mm -hmm. I know uh, when I get really bad, then uh, my number one thing, there's, Many things, of course, but music is such a huge influence on me. Mm -hmm. Um, And finding that perfect song because somebody has written it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Whether that is. There are a lot of good songs out there. Some kind of rock song where I need to scream my lungs out, or if it's a quiet worship song where I'm just resting in the truth of God. Like, either way, music can help bring some. Caring jingle. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) Sharing is caring, fa la la la. Very good. Thank you, producer. We got it. <laughs> to follow up on that, number two would have to be humor because uh, yeah. laughter is a good medicine. Like <laughs> yeah. It really is. And I'd say your dad does that a lot. Yeah. yeah. It is, but how do, how do you get yourself, if you're in that spot, how do you get yourself to the point of being able to laugh? Because that's where I don't I can't do that like that quick. Oh oh gosh no, it's not always quick for sure. But um, 
I mean, sometimes I'll I'll go searching for it, like in like YouTube or something. I'll I'll find comedians that I know, and I'm like, I need I need idea. to laugh. Like I'm gonna watch me some Mark Lowry, like or some Tim Hawkins. Like. Well, you can laugh at yourself, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do that. that. <laughs> I'll watch my cat do like playing with her toys. She does some hilarious things, throwing her little toys around, or talk to Sterling. He's a pretty funny guy. Like, <laughs> do you think it's like? <laughs> <laughs> or my daughter doing bunny hairs behind his head. She's also pretty hilarious. So, do, do you think those are forms of grounding? Because I think they are. I I I notice. Oftentimes, we can get into a state of depression. We don't even know we're depressed. Mm-hmm. I think that's the case. And so, again, you have to acknowledge it so you can change it. And I found with my life, like, I know I'm in that state. Because I love nature. When I stop noticing the trees and the flowers. And so I will make a conscious effort to go drive or walk in the yard or something and go, oh, look at that. That's so pretty. Or the sky or, you know, just grounding myself. That's actually a physical thing, too. It really does. Yes. If you exercise, which is if you go walk and if you get fresh air (laughs) and sunshine, those things, uh, seriously, those things literally affect you physically and will lift your spirits. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, (laughs) Shell. You're welcome. Thank you. That was good. Very good. We are uplifting and we are encouraged to go protect now. And you've made a, a group of support here. That's all right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> FFP for life. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, let's move right on then. I don't know what our time is like, but we're lolling. So <laughs> we're lolling. I chose these because I knew what our topic was. So I was trying to think of things that would affect families and young people kind of thing. So that's why I chose these particular articles. Um, This is, uh, I don't know who this is from. It's on the tip sheet town hall website. And um, the White House has trouble responding to news of mass layoffs. Um, So speaking to reporters at the White House Tuesday afternoon, Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre had a hard time explaining recent red flags in the economy including massive layoffs at a number of major companies in a wide range of industries. Quote, the president has also done a lot of work to get this economy going again, right? He's done a lot of work to make sure that this economy is is being built from the bottom up, middle out, end quote. As she said that in response to questions about the thousands of layoffs at companies like UPS and others. Uh, She continued, we're always concerned hearing about layoffs, but at the same time, we are trying to build an economy that works for all and leaves no one behind. (laughs) I have to laugh, sorry. (laughs) The negative economic indicators come as the White House and Biden campaign continue their push on Bidenomics, which I've heard of that. (laughs) Uh, I think we all have. Uh, Which they claim has made the lives of everyday Americans better. Hmm. The data in the polls tell a different story. And I think our personal experiences would say it tells a different story. Mm -hmm. Um, Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said in testimony for the House Financial Services Committee that the labor market is, quote, strong. Not really bad. So the environment that we live in, uh, that kids live in, when your parents aren't working, when you don't have money to feed yourself, clothe yourself, do the things that you enjoy, that's going to cause a strain on your mental health. That's <laughs> sure. It's very mm-hmm. stressful. Yeah. yeah. Like when there, you don't have control, uh, when there's uncertainty. So that's hard. <laughs> so I heard an interesting take on this. <clears throat> For the one percenters, Actually, there was a, there was um, some article, and they classified the elites as somebody who makes one hundred fifty thousand or more, and super elites are people who make that, but also graduated from the um, colleges, Ivy League colleges. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's elites and super elites. For them, that's true. The economy is just fine. It's and most of those of people are in politics. Yes. 
Exactly. And not banking. the business, not the bad business people, and you know, that people are always and CEOs about. and yes. So they don't see that the economy is bad. It's people like us, us common folk hmm. that do, and we're living it every day. Um, speaking from somebody who lost their job in September as part of a 3% decrease in staffing, which doesn't sound like a lot, but we had 85,000 employees worldwide. Only people in the U.S. were let go. And I've seen a trend in that across other companies because I'm following these layoffs <laughs> closely as I'm job hunting. And I'm on LinkedIn pretty much every day. And um, it's so discouraging to see the posts of people saying, I lost my job two years ago and I still haven't found a job and I can't draw unemployment and I literally have zero income and I have kids to take care of and I'm going to lose my house. I mean, they're all over LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. All over the place. Mm -hmm. um, the job market is saturated right now mm -hmm. um, with people hunting for a job. So I don't buy it, and it makes me angry because, yes, for them it's not. It's a great economy. Plus, I heard that they fudge, they're fudging the numbers of unemployment, too. Oh, I'm oh, sure. Oh, they're, they're, playing, <laughs> they're playing games with the numbers. Big time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big time. I, I work for a nonprofit, that, and we help people with, you know, utility assistance and rent assistance and food, like meals and things, and uh, more and more people are coming to us. Right. But at the same time, we're having a hard time helping them because less people are donating to us because they don't have the money to donate. And it's right. it's just a vicious cycle, right. you know. And then us employees, you know, nonprofit workers do not get paid a lot. Let me mm -hmm. just tell you that right now. We do a lot of work, and it uh, you know when someone sticks around in a nonprofit that it means something to them. Yeah. Because it's definitely not for the money. It's value driven. <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. and so just I can't and then with the job market thing, Sterling was looking for a job and, and Cameron was looking for a job. All these places said they were hiring, but then when they would apply, they would be denied. And it's like, why? What is that? Right. Why? I'm and really so confused with that. Um I mean, they had both, they've talked about this, so it's okay. <laughs> they both had put that they have disabilities, which, and they do have valid disabilities. And that was one of the reasons they kept getting denied. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so Sterling finally didn't put the disability on there, got hired, but now he's in pain every single day that he works. Yeah. So... <laughs> There's definitely a disconnect there. Um, I would say about the economy and the inflation and the cost of things, that's a that's something that could be fixed with, you know, going back to the um, the pipeline, you know, reopening the pipeline and lifting the regulations on our on our fossil fuel industry and and stop sending everything overseas again. I remember when NAFTA went into place, I, I, I was just in my 20s. So mm -hmm. this isn't rocket science, okay? I was in my 20s and thought, how dumb is this? Because let's say you have a, a world pot of money. Mm -hmm. The U.S. owns this portion of it. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to send stuff overseas, which is going to send that money over to another country, which reduces the U.S.'s portion of the world market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. It's not rocket science, right? Right. Now they're doing it again. Like I said, companies are laying off a lot of Americans. I think there, there's a well, conspiracy costs, behind that. It costs more to do business in the U.S. right it's, now. Because it's not just that, I don't think. Of the policies. I think it goes deeper than it, that. It might be more than that. Mm -hmm. Carry on, um, <laughs> Crystal. But they're hiring a lot of people in Europe. And, okay. and, and, of course, India, um, and keeping those people on the payrolls. It, I don't think Europe makes that much less than we do, is my point. They could. They have a lot more benefits than we do. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what that is, but I think there's something deeper behind it than just that we cost more as employees. 
It could also be a market reset think, because... No, I don't mean the employees are costing more. It just costs more to do business because when you raise the gas prices, you raise the price on everything, yeah. Yeah. everything that you do. And when you raise the regulations, when you make it more difficult and raise the taxes on the upper class people who are running those businesses, then you you automatically create this, this problem. It's a mm-hmm. self-created problem. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's so, true. I mean, that that's why I appreciated Trump so much because he was always America first. Yeah. And he started deregulating. And then we realized how many regulations we really had. Because for every one that he started new, he let go, was it two or three? Yeah. He, he canceled. That. And it was just, there were still thousands and thousands of regulations. I mean, we are just, we are overregulated. Well, think about it. In the beginning, politicians, that wasn't their full-time job. Right. No. <laughs> oh, I, I, this We've has been on decades, my mind. decades, <laughs> decades of it being a full-time job for them. Mm-hmm. They never take laws away. They just keep adding more and more and more. Mm-hmm. That's human nature. Even the United Nations does that. Mm-hmm. Every government does that, it seems like, um, because they think that's their job. Mm-hmm. But we've got but we've got such ludicrous book, uh, laws on the books from states that were in place like in the 1800s that they've never gotten rid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Speaking of laws, we're going to talk about something that has to do with that. Nice segue. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, coming from Human Events, this opinion piece. I want to know what y'all's opinion on this is. Um, Libby Emmons asks, will all parents of violent teens be punished for their children's actions or just white moms who should have known better? So a mother has been found legally responsible for her son's crimes. Jennifer Crumbly was found guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter after her son Ethan took a gun to school and shot up his classmates, killing four of them. This is the first time that a parent has been held directly responsible for the crimes of their minor child. Mrs. Crumbly may have been a bad mom, of which there are many across the U.S. She's the first mom ever in the U.S. to be convicted for her child's crime in this way. Does the verdict against her spell trouble for the bad moms of all teen killers in the U.S.? Prosecutors in the Michigan case claim that Mrs. Crumbly did not prevent her 15-year-old son from harming others. You're 15. You You are old enough to make your own decisions. You are. Um, her son, Ethan, is in prison for the rest of his life. He killed four people. That, I think, is a good thing. But now she faces 60 years in prison, which is essentially a death sentence for a middle-aged mom because of his crimes. The verdict sets a shocking precedent for the parents of violence-prone children. Will all parents of violent children be held accountable for it? Uh, will only the parents of school shooters be held accountable? Only white parents of school shooters? Like, ha, ha, where is the, the line set? What, what kind of laws are they going to make to enforce this, to follow this precedent? There has to be one already that they <laughs> followed to get a conviction. Uh, and I, I could tell you, <laughs> when, when I was growing up, that was the case. Parents were held responsible for their kids' actions. Somewhere it got away from that. To a certain degree, yes. But for murder like that, and to be, like, because other parents have been charged with, like, child neglect in a case like this. Um, but to be charged with involuntary manslaughter, like, that, to me, is too far. I don't <laughs> think I would charge her with that. I mean, I don't know the details of the case, but I think it really does depend on each case yeah. and what happened you know, if your son has a room full of guns and bombs and you don't report it or turn him in, then yes, you might, you or probably you don't even are know about it. Somewhat Columbine liable. Columbine was like that. Or if you don't know about it, mm-hmm. then it's neglect, as Sarah said, mm-hmm. really there. But as far as being responsible for them taking a gun and shooting people, I like she said, that is a, a decision that their child has made. And honestly, they, I don't know if they have or they talked about it. it, They probably have done uh, for minors, charge them as adults, depending on what they did and what the circumstances were. So then they have full responsibility for that because 
at some point you have to say you can't you can't do this. What if the kid was six? Like mental health issue or no, six years old. Oh, six years this old. One was I 15. thought you said sick. You guys um, were saying they he knew six. what was right or wrong, but he's still a minor. Right. He's a minor, that's true, but uh the whole, idea, the whole the, idea of minority or whatever minority being a minor, like the whole idea of teenagers is a very new concept in the world. You were an adult at 15, 100 years ago. Mm. Nothing to it. <laughs> you were already an adult. You were fully in your job uh, or at least a, an apprenticeship of some sort. You were not, you know, like you were starting to have families like... Yeah. So, yes, they should know, by it. but then it all goes back to how are we raising them? How right. are we teaching them? What is their mental health like? Like, right. I, is I, there I, neglect? I guess, like, <laughs> I guess I would have to know the details of the case. I don't know the details. Each, each thing, I would say each thing is different, and you can't, you know, make a blanket statement on that, but, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, it, the article even points out there's, I mean, there's teen violence all the time and all over the place. It talks about in Las Vegas, I just uh, remember a time when I was growing up and not murdering in school, but yeah. if a kid in the neighborhood did something or said something wrong, parents were going to the other parents saying, hey, your kid did this. Take care of your child. Take yeah. care of it. Right. Um, we don't have that anymore either. Okay. Yeah. I did see something back during the BLM riots and um, a parent came out and took care of their child that was involved in that and pulled them out of there. I remember and, that video. Remember that video? Yeah, vaguely. I mean that and everybody was cheering mom on because she was she was taking, you know, look, you're not gonna do this. Get out of here. What do you think you're doing? Yeah. Go home. You know, she was she was I letting him know that it was her. not it was not allowed. It's not correct. You can't do that. I think so, if the law is a minor know. up to eighteen, ultimately you do hold accountability for your household. I like I said, I agree to a certain extent, like Just like neglect or something. It's those different. charges yeah. are like extreme, like involuntary manslaughter because yeah, your son did that. Yeah. Unless yeah. you handed him the gun and told him to go do it, and then it's not really involuntary anymore because right. you were directly in it. Right. Then I I think that is too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Personally, what do you think? I think it's crazy all the way around. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's so much, like, teen suicide's a big thing, but teen violence in general, teen gangs, it talks about that in the article. There's, you know, teen gangs all over the place, too, and they do all kinds of crazy stuff all the time. And what are we doing to help them, to to rescue them from that well, and to protect the other ones I'm from that? You, they have to want to help or it won't work. Right. Yeah, not, and a lot of them don't want to help. And so it's a two-edged sword. You have to have consequences uh, exactly. that, that match the crime. Yep. And if you're going to go beat someone, one of your peers to death, you know, I've heard several times of gangs ganging up on one person and beating them to death. Even the girl. I mean, that's that's yeah. just, there should be consequences. Yeah. Appropriate consequences for that. Yes. For the child. Right. <laughs> for the one doing it. <laughs> Well, if it was a group, it should be for the whole group. Well, yeah, for for the people committing the acts. Right. You know, the the other stuff, uh, definitely case-by-case case scenario for, like, parents. How responsible are they? Yeah, you were probably a bad parent for them to even start thinking that way, but are you actually responsible for the harm done? How far, if you start taking it, then how far does it go? Let's think of it from the victim's perspective. The victim and the family is of the victim's perspective. Yeah. Like, and you have to sort of look at, uh, well, I'm sure they reached out to somebody, you know, well, let's hope that they reached out the, the victim's family reached out and tried to contact parents or school authority or whoever and say, look, my child's being beat up. Can you please do something? Right. Yeah. You know, rather than not knowing about it or, you know what I'm saying? Just being it, completely yeah. random and right. sudden. Or yeah. it could be too. Yeah, could've that been. happens sometimes. It all, it all just, yeah. How far do you take it? Do you take it? I don't the, think only the person. And, and do you yeah, take so. it to the parents? Do you take it to the school system if it happened at school? Uh, do you take it because oh they're black or they're Hispanic or they're illegal immigrant? Is is it all that to blame? Saw, like, how I, far do you take it? I actually saw 
post on the Reddit thread mm-hmm. about the story I told you about earlier where the teachers were saying that they were specifically told that if it was a, a person of color, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't they couldn't expel them or suspend them or anything. Or they couldn't give them any consequences. I, I don't agree with that, but these are actual teachers posting this. So, and it's not restricted to a state or anything like that. So, I don't know where these people are as teachers, what state they're in, but that's not right at all. Mm-hmm. It's it's racism no matter how you chalk it up. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and we were, I don't know, I don't know how you feel, but when I was growing up in the 80s, I don't feel like we had racism. We didn't. We got along with everybody because we had fought that already. Uh, well, I there would disagree it, with that well, one, there, but it wasn't it wasn't in the light like it is now. But well, it, I, too much light is on it now, and it's extreme. I so. don't think so. I think there were <laughs> exceptions to that, of course, to every rule. But generally, we didn't have it. Maybe not in your circles and where you were living. But I, I do... There was definitely racism, uh, uh, systemic racism that is still being fought now. Um, we have unconscious bias. Like, I I know that I have bias against it. Like, and I've been trying to work on that. Like, even wow. m- now. <laughs> mm. Like, and uh, and it's hard to, to face that. You know, you don't want to admit you're wrong. You know, and I always say I love everybody, and I do. I love everybody, but when I'm scared to walk by your house because you're a different color than me, then that is a bias. That is a form of racism. Hmm. And it's and that's what we have to realize. I'll just say okay on that. <laughs> yeah, it's just a it's – a, it's something that you do have to overcome. Yeah. And you, if you have that kind of thought, then you have to say, no, I'm not going to be that way. Right. I'm going to, you know, I'm just. Gonna I mean, I'm not going to go walking on the right. south side of Chicago at night by myself. Right. Okay. That's not. That's I not mean, racist. It's just not safe. Exactly. Right? You understand that exactly. it's, it's just, it's not, just safe. not safe. Right, and that's just a truth, a fact about, and right. it doesn't matter that you know it could have been anybody. Right. It could be a white neighborhood. Uh huh. But who Mars knows? Hill, I wouldn't do it either. <laughs> Oh, no, not Mars Hill. I know, right? (laughs) I lived there for a while. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, I don't see it that way. It it is sad to me, though, that minorities are portrayed in that light, that um, Right, it's not fair to them either. It's really not. Because they, they, uh, what am I trying to say? Oh, I just lost it. I think I know what you're going to say. All right, go ahead. <laughs> it puts Crystal. them in a position of the oppressed victim. Right. Where that's where, assuming that. Right. Where and where they can't do anything. Exactly. They're helpless to do anything for themselves. Yeah, and that's, that's not fair. No. They can overcome it. They can yep. win. They can do better. And I, they I can tell you, uh-huh. I know plenty of families who are people of color that have a better house than me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> or they have better jobs than me. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I don't see it. I don't see it as being a major issue. A hundred percent. And but, a lot, all the athletes and stuff, yeah. so they have done well, too. Yeah. <laughs> any and any for your thoughts? <laughs> and celebrities. And, <laughs> and celebrities. Yeah. It seems yeah. like the ones that tout that a lot are the ones that are celebrities and the ones that are athletes and the ones that are... <laughs> I know politics use it all the time. Yeah. I mean, they do full-on polls about minorities and races and all that, which brings us to our final article from the Washington Free Beacon. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Woo for segues. (laughs) I need to ride one home. (laughs) Uh, The Democrats' support among minorities hits an all-time low, according to this poll. Mm -hmm. Um, It has... Uh, the support from black and Hispanic voter- voters has plummeted to an all-time low over the past three years, according to a Gallup poll released on Wednesday. Uh, black voters who identify as or lean towards Democratic thoughts outnumbered those who identify um, or lean towards Republican by 47 percentage points in 2023, down from 66 percentage points in 2020. That's a big difference in only three years. Mm-hmm. Um Marking the narrowest gap ever reported by Gallup. 
Around 66% of black adults now would vote Democratic compared with 19% favoring Republican. Gallup's findings also revealed historically low support among Hispanic voters for the Democratic Party, whose lead over the GOP among that group shrank from 28 percentage points in 2020 to only 12 percentage points in 2023. So while 47% of Hispanic adults align with Democrats, 35% express a preference for Republicans. The waning support among black and Hispanic voters presents a challenge for the Democratic Party, given that the two minority groups have historically been among the party's most reliable support bases, which they have pushed and pushed and pushed that. That's why I said they use that as a political tool. Yes. So. They um, weaponize it. (laughs) They weaponize it. That is true. Mm -hmm. Representative James Clyburn um, on Sunday downplayed concerns about President Joe Biden losing support among black Americans, noting that, quote, Biden got 96% of the vote in this primary, but its largest percentage, over 97%, was in the town of Orangeburg, where there are two HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities and a community college. Uh, So that demonstrates to me what I've been saying all the time and that Joe Biden has not lost any support among African Americans, end quote. He's not lost any support, but the poll says he's lost a lot of support. Yeah. <laughs> and my experience with people demonstrates that. <laughs> right, yeah, we were just talking about that before the show. Uh, and yeah, that's yeah. a lot. <laughs> but um, let's see. And I US- could give a story about Hispanic people who, who love their families and who are many times strong Catholic. And so they have those conservative values mm-hmm. and they don't like the, the push with the Democrats, with mm-hmm. all this other stuff, confusion that they're pushing on people and and doing so. Oh yeah, I mean, I hear, I've heard testimonies or read articles and things um, that full on support, like the like the more Republican conservative side, they don't want like socialism or things like that. They've lived it; mm-hmm. it's not good. <laughs> they mm-hmm. they got away from it for a reason right <laughs> like, exactly they experienced it already and they're not interested yeah mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. yeah yeah and also with the crime as well you find that in they're they're talking about being the democrats are traditionally soft on crime and feeling sorry for the criminal and uh, the hispanics are saying hey please we would like to be safe in our community so please take care of the crime you know right. so they're uh, really harder on crime than you might think Mm -hmm. so they're harder on their own people than our broken justice system Mm -hmm. yes (laughs) well they they can all think even with the illegal immigrants coming across or illegal ones doesn't matter they're coming from third world countries where that was the norm too lawlessness gangs they're used to that they don't want to come here and have to deal with it Mm mm-hmm there's a lot of that. I Yeah, there's two ways to look at that. There's one way to look at that like this is normal for them, so they don't notice. Or, boy, we had higher expectations for America. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> there's thoughts. a lot to think about. Deep thoughts. I know, right? <laughs> there, there's just so much. I could just keep going on for days and days and days, <laughs> personal experience. and do you, do you think the root cause, though, is division? To keep stirring the pot so we're all divided all the time? Oh, yeah. Satan uses that all yeah. the time. I mean, yeah. Jesus says that. A house divided itself it cannot stand. And the devil is the author of confusion. So yep. He sure is. He's yep. going to break you and twist your thoughts and point you as far away from Jesus as he can. <laughs> like He doesn't want us to have peace. No. no, he doesn't. That's he, for sure. that, you know. he wants us in turmoil. And we, we have to, here's the thing I go back to, Yvonne, I know you're going to be with me on this. We have to stop being the silent majority. We need to stop being silent. We need to activate. We need, we need, to, need to be doing things silent. and fighting yeah. things. I agree. Um, because uh, you can't just sit and go, well, I have faith in God and he'll take care of it. That's not going to work. He, no. he, he can take care of it, but. He depended on David to fight Goliath. He used him as a tool to do it. He uses people to he do his does. work. He does. Mm-hmm. And if we just sit and go, well, I'll just have faith in God. What all, if All it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Exactly. Exactly. That was a good quote. 
That is a good quote. <laughs> nice. So Pull that one out, Mom. <laughs> I I have heard that and seen it several times over the past four or five years. So. I, I had a conversation with some people that got let go with me. We have a regular call, and they're all Christians. And um, I was talking about some of this stuff, and, and they said, like one of them said, Crystal, I believe a lot like everyone else on this call, but I don't talk about it. Because, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it at work. It wasn't until after all of us got let go that we actually knew we were all Christians. Isn't that something? <laughs> and, and It should not be uh, that exactly. Way. And he said, I just don't feel comfortable talking about this stuff. Um, I, don't, I, I guess I'm just not as bold. And I said, well, I'm tired of being silent. And they tell you not to talk about all kinds of stuff at work. Uh, Your faith, you can't talk about. Uh, Politics, they discourage. Don't talk about your pay. Right. Although in some states, it's illegal for a company to stop you from talking about it. Because I got in trouble at the BMV for talking about pay uh, uh, with superiors before. Like openly, uh, Josh is back there saying, yes, I got in trouble for that too. And it, <laughs> I looked it up in Indiana. There's not a, th- cause they tried to tell me that there was a law saying that I couldn't talk about it. I looked it up. There, there is, is not, not a law. Please talk about your pay. Cause that's the only way you're going to know you're not getting paid enough. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. Like you're not going to see, you know, Sterling yeah. went through that at his job, you know, past, uh, he worked at a place for, five years I think it was at that point um and people someone had just started and was having issues with his time clock or something so Sterling happened to see his pay and it was like almost the exact same amount as what he was making after working there five years and he said heck no so So he went straight to the top and he got everybody raises (laughs) well that happens when they uh, (laughs) when they up the minimum wage yeah, well, and that's what the people happened. that exist don't get increases to compensate for yep, that. That's exactly what happened. People that come in new get the new rate. Yeah, mm-hmm. but then they don't tell the people who've been working there. That's exactly well, what happened. You have to follow the law, you know, when the law is going into place. Mm, oh, yeah, companies do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, we, not, I'm not no, sure companies always do no, that. We <laughs> have to. We have to. I really feel like it's can, a free sure. speech issue. All of that is a free speech yes. issue. Yeah. It's our First Amendment yep. in the Constitution. Please, please, please go back to that. Yes. <laughs> and we need to all be speaking up. Well, my gosh, and you can't call it, oh, that's hate speech or whatever the things that... No, it's not. It's me talking about, I work this hard. I need to be compensated. (laughs) Right. And and then free speech and freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. I should be able to tell people I'm a Christian. Like, and and that not be an issue. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They can agree. They can agree or disagree with that. And they can say what they want to say. So we should be able to say what we want to say. Right. I'm I a totally Christian. Agree. I believe in God and he created everything and he loves you and he loves these kids in my case. And since I work with children and, you know, and they there, need there Jesus no, and that's and the only Jesus. way they're going to heaven. And that's right. And there is right and wrong. And <laughs> sin, yes. Yeah. You know, and you're not an animal and you're not an animal and there's only two genders and, you know, speak truth. All of that yep. is just, you know, that's stuff that we need to say out loud. Yes. Because That's what we're doing here. Out loud. Woo-hoo. Out loud. <laughs> <laughs> out loud and proud. <laughs> we're using that phrase not in the way it's normally used. <laughs> she said out loud, not out. <laughs> right. I got that. I got you. <laughs> See, we can have fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have moments. <laughs> that was really witty. Thank you. <laughs> I loved it. She's pretty smart, you know. I know. <laughs> I pee up all day. That's what we got to do. to make gotta me gotta blush. Yes. <laughs> we got to hype each other up. You are beautiful. You are smart. You are strong. We are wonderful, amazing women doing the show tonight. Amen. You are creative. Yes. <laughs> no one got you, so I got you. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. And what's Journey? <laughs> and Journey's lazy. <laughs> well, I called her the life of the party earlier. Oh. So. <laughs> she's got the right idea of what taking next. She's not tired now. We put her to sleep. Yeah, she's like, no. 
<laughs> oh my goodness yeah. gracious. But we aren't just some, uh, we're not blonde little empty thought things. Like we've had some deep conversation tonight. Like, yes, and I love it. I love women it. are very capable. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> we have uh, strong opinions and strong thoughts and the, the four of us are going to put some of that to action. Like. Yep. <laughs> We're going to take over the world. <laughs> oh, no. Pinky I the have brain. a strong, independent young lady over there. <laughs> Hello, Serenity. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. Okay. <laughs> she cracks me up. <laughs> she's, she's being raised right, Mama. Okay. So... <laughs> as we die down here we're gonna have to say goodbye it has been so much fun though and you please 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 like and comment let us know what you thought of the all ladies crew and uh, we can hopefully do it again sometime um sounds like fun my best friend miss michelle foreman brought our wonderful message with our bible scriptures about protecting <laughs> my mom gave some wonderful commentary yvonne Metcalf. thanks for coming back <laughs> Crystal Rosati. Rosati. <laughs> <laughs> Always a joy to talk with you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I try, try to Say what now? Uh, I've been told, please go check out the website. Um, Revolver, Revolver Broadcasting, Broadcasting right? Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Broadcasting. Dot com. That's right. I went and checked it out, and you really can. It's pretty easy to find the different shows and stuff, so the format's really good. So go check it out and check out all our different shows because there's a lot. Crystal's even about to be having her show posted, so yes. we're pretty excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I've been your host, Sarah Metcalf Allen. Have a wonderful, joyful Get in trouble kind of night. Yes. <laughs> the party's over. <laughs>